Hello, everyone. My name is Jack Cable. And I'm Alex Sahir. We are both election security technical advisors for the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA. CISA is essentially the nation's risk advisor. So in the case of elections, we advise state and local governments on how to conduct elections securely. We also provide cybersecurity services to assess their systems um, and ensure that they are secure. Um, so our goal for this talk is essentially to explore how election security has changed since March with the pandemic. Because of course, elections are going to be looking a little different this year with an expansion of mail-in balloting across the country, um, a reduction in polling places due to poll worker shortages. So we're seeing consolidated polling places. Um, and of course, in-person voting is going to have to operate much differently so that is safe with the pandemic. Um, so all of this compiled together, we want to think about how election security changes. Um, so that's what we're going to explore today. Great. Thanks for the intro, Jack. Um, so uh, what we'll do first is sort of talk through specifically why this election looks different than any other election we've had before. Um, so the first thing, and this has been publicized quite widely, is uh, a lot of the country is moving towards mail-in balloting uh, as a stable option for everyone. Um, so you're going to see a large increase in the folks who decide to uh, exercise their ability to do mail-in balloting. So um, what this means operationally is, some, well, some states uh, already did a lot of mail-in balloting, like California or Washington. Um, some states, it's not part of their tradition for the most part. So uh, that is changing with this pandemic. Um, and so uh, you're going to see a lot of states ramp up their capability to uh, provide mail-in balloting uh, quite quickly. In the, in the coming months, um, they already have the summer and also in the lead up to November. Um, so that there's a lot of uh, specific infrastructure uh, that's specific to mail-in balloting and Jack's gonna go into that later. Um, and so these systems are being introduced quite quickly uh, and potentially there are gonna be some ramifications of that. Um, a second component here is um, in-person voting. As Jack mentioned before, it looks, is gonna look quite different this year than it has in the past. Um, and what that means is, uh, you know, for example, uh, there's uh, quite a shortage of uh, polling place staff. And so the reason why there is um, a lot of the folks who staff the polls for the most part are elderly. And uh, with COVID-19, there are uh, a, a heightened risks associated with that. So uh, there are some estimates that 500,000 to 1 million new poll workers will be required to staff this election. Um, in addition, uh, shortages like that and other sort of resource uh, shortages uh, because of the pandemic are going to require consolidating polling places significantly uh, in, in some places. And what that means is a lot of places are moving to more of a super center model where sort of a, a city stadium or some similar large public place will be used uh, to allow for social distancing and also just uh, simplify logistics uh, significantly. And so that, that looks quite different. So the, the, the big tagline here is um, for the average voter, what this means is there's probably going to be quite a bit of confusion with regards to how this election will work, um, what is and is not safe, uh, what is and is not valid. Um, and so with that confusion, we've seen in the past few years, what happens is uh, disinformation, misinformation risk significantly increases. People are more likely to think something is invalid or something is something that uh, might be false is actually true or vice versa. So there's just going to be a lot of confusion going on. So uh, we think that increases the risk to disinformation regarding the voting process. And so now Jack is going to go more into the specifics of uh, these changes. Great. So yeah, as Alex said, just to explore some more of the specific areas of technology that are being expanded out or um, say remain important in some significant manner. Um, and in this slide, we won't be talking directly to the risks. We'll get to those a little later, but this is just to lay the groundwork um, for what types of technologies we can expect to be used uh, for the 2020 election, recognizing that it is going to be conducted differently than other elections in the past. Um, so the first area of technology is voter registration systems that are used to track who's registered to vote, um, say their address of registration, other information associated with that. Um, of course, these systems are nothing new. They've been used for years, um, play even a large role in in-person voting when you show up to the polling place in order to check your name in the poll book in order to make sure that you're registered to vote. Um, but the role that they play in mail-in elections is a little different because now they are used as a source to either determine 
where mail-in ballot applications are going to be sent or where mail-in ballots themselves are going to be sent. Um, so the security of these systems is going to be integral into ensuring that um, the election can run smoothly. Um, other voter facing online systems are also key. Um, we're seeing expansions of different systems related specifically to absentee ballots. Uh, for instance, portals to request an absentee ballot or to track your ballot. Um, a lot of these systems either didn't exist before um, this election or existed but were used in um, a lot smaller but capacity. Um, so we can expect all these to have increased load and as a result, increased cybersecurity risk um, associated with them. And then of course, there's other voter facing systems such as election night reporting, which will remain key throughout um, the election as they have in the past. Um, then the third point is talking specifically to the absentee ballot pipeline. So this isn't necessarily what is actually facing the voters, but rather the technology that is going to be required to conduct a primarily mail-in election, uh, which is what many states are shifting towards. And um, this will require anything from the ballot printing and distribution process to getting vendors in that in order to ensure that people actually get their ballot ballots and that um, they are correctly um, coordinated, um, along with processes for ballot return, verifying voters' signatures, tabulating ballots, scanning them. All of this has to be conducted. And for a lot of states, this will be an additional challenge because like Alex said, we're seeing perhaps in some 10 times as many mail-in ballots compared to previous years. Um, and when this happens, there's an increased risk, say, for technology strain, just because um, in a lot of cases, there's limited technology to process these ballots. Um, so it increases the possibility that um, some technical error can occur. Um, so that's just uh, kind of laying out um, what is going to happen, uh, what technologies we're seeing rolled out, um, and we'll get more to these specific risks in a bit. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, and so now, now talking more about the specific risks here. So obviously with any technology, it could fail, right? Uh, each, of these, each of these technologies are meant to do a certain thing uh, and it, they're part of a pipeline. Any of them might, might be hacked or fail. So, uh, you know, traditionally when we think of uh, election security, we think of hackers, you know, what can hackers do? How can they uh, SQL inject a database or cross-site script or something like that? Um, while those risks definitely still exist, uh, one one change that this rapid change in infrastructure uh, is, is going to cause uh, to the risk landscape is reliability is a significant concern now. Uh, a lot of these systems are going to see a usage pattern that they have not seen before. And anyone who deals in uh, computer systems knows that when you when you have a system that is uh, old or or sort of has been used for a while and it sees a new usage pattern, uh, the potential for operational failure is is significant. So, um, you know, you know, the hacking risk absolutely does still exist. But what we what we assess is that the, the, the you know, it just could fail as part of the operation of the system. A good example of this that isn't quite related to the 2020 election ex exactly um, is the Iowa caucus uh, situation that happened in February. Uh, the, Iowa, the, the Iowa caucus was run by the Iowa Democratic Party, so it was not run by the state of Iowa. But, uh, and so therefore, you know, those risks maybe don't directly translate. But, um, you know, this was an app that failed not because of a hacker, but because of the use of the app, right? So, so there are reports that sort of the, the folks who were uh, needing to operate this app were not properly trained. The user experience of the app uh, did not quite work. Uh, the backup system that was in place uh, uh, in case the app failed uh, was not caught through quite quite enough. Um, so, you know, while there was not an, a hack of this app, it absolutely did fail at its job. And there's actually uh, polls that suggest that voters to this day still don't really know who won the Democratic Iowa caucus because of uh, what happened uh, uh, during the caucus night. So, you know, that that sort of thing happening on election night is absolutely possible. And so, you know, thinking through the reliability concerns is really, really important. Another point that Jack already made that sort of I'm just pointing out again here is, um, you know, voting registration databases have been important uh, and, and paramount to, to running elections for a long time. But uh, in particular, with the increase of vote by mail, uh, those systems, those databases uh, are what decide uh, where a mail-in ballot is sent. 
And so um, obviously ensuring the sanctity of those systems and the accuracy of those records is very, very important to making sure that this election runs smoothly. So, yeah. Great, then just to get into um, some of the more specific risks to the infrastructure that we're seeing. Um, and to start with voter registration systems, um, of course, as we saw in 2016, these, er these systems are a ripe area for attack. Uh, we saw the successful compromise, for instance, of Illinois' State Board of Elections voter registration system in 2016 by Russian actors. And while there's no evidence that votes were changed, or that, sorry, that voter registration records were changed, uh, we do know that uh, voter registration records were exfiltrated. Um, and we saw targeting of all 50 states in addition to that. Um, so basing on what we've already seen and what we can expect for 2020, we certainly do think that um, there are heightened risks here, say given both the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of these systems. Uh, for instance, modifying voter registration records uh, would result in perhaps a mail-in ballot application or mail-in ballot itself being sent to the wrong address, um, and availability concerns as well um, could prevent certain people from getting their ballots. Um, along with this, we also assess that there is risk with other voter-facing online systems. Um, for instance, absentee ballot request, absentee ballot tracking systems can also be targeted. Um, and then one other um, online-facing system that we've seen a bit of expansion, um, not too many states, but some have come forward with this, is electronic ballot return, also known as online voting. Um, and for this, CISA does assess that online voting is higher risk than, say, in-person or mail-in voting, just because there is no paper trail. So you cannot achieve the same level of auditability. Um, so that is CISA's um, risk assessment there. Um, and all of this is to you highlight um, with voter registration systems with other online facing systems that there is just um, a shifted attack surface um, that attackers may be targeting. So it's important that we prioritize these when we're thinking about how best to secure the elections before November, keeping in mind that election officials do face significant resource constraints. Running an election is incredibly difficult um, and it is our role, it is the role of the public to support election officials in that process. Um, so we'll get to in a little what exactly um, both election officials can do as well as what hackers in this audience can do to ensure that the election does run smoothly, safely, and securely. Um, but um, kind of just to lay out that this is something that everyone can play a role in um, and everyone can help with. Um, and then the third um, component here is the mail-in ballot pipeline. Um, so this is talking about everything from distribution of ballots, um, a wide range of vendors who are responsible, say, for um, compiling these records, for printing the ballots, for mailing them out. Um, and really just to footstomp what Alex was saying before, that the biggest risk to this process is not necessarily the, say, an actual attack against these systems, but rather a routine technical failure, um, because these systems are going to be strained um, and operated at increased levels. Um, so we assess that the biggest concern, especially for the mail and ballot pipeline, where many of these systems are not internet connected, um, the bigger risk is just a routine technical failure rather than, um, say, an actual attack. Although, of course, we do know that these systems are being targeted, continue to be vigilant in looking for and preventing these attacks. Great. And then the next slide which we were talking about before is the risk of disinformation and this um, really just goes to show that um, the biggest risk towards an election outcome is not an actual um, hack but rather distrust in the results um, because as we explored operational hiccups are not unlikely um, and in fact we can probably expect that somewhere in the country on election day some technical error will go wrong but what is important to keep in mind here is that this does not mean that the results of the election are invalid. This does not mean that uh, we say don't actually know what happened. There is a paper trail. Um, in fact, compared to 2016, when 82% of votes were cast with a paper trail, we now expect 92% votes to be cast with a paper trail in 2020, which is a significant improvement. 
And what that means is that votes are increasingly auditable. So we can actually ensure that um, the tabulated result is accurate. Uh, we recommend, for instance, risk limiting audits, um, all of those procedures in order to ensure that election outcomes are valid. But the key thing to emphasize here is that we can expect some hiccups to occur, but that does not mean that something um, went wrong or that the results are invalid. Um, but the bigger risk here is that um, the public perception of these hiccups. We saw, for instance, in the primaries in Georgia, that routine technical failures occurred with poll books, um, and this led to um, some public distrust in the election events. Um, so this is kind of a case study in what can happen in November, that we can expect technology to go wrong. And um, of course, it is possible that there has been an attack, but that's not the most likely case. What is most likely is that rather there's a routine error um, as all these technologies are being rapidly expanded, that something just went wrong. Um, so the main, the main takeaway here from a public perspective is that we need to be resilient and we need to understand that there are controls in place, um, that it's actually incredibly difficult to actually change votes um, because there's a wide range of election systems and it's very difficult to actually change those, but the bigger risk is people's perception. Um, so just kind of viewing that, um, we need to be thinking about how we can make people more resilient um, because when something, say when a routine technical error does go wrong, how are we going to respond and how are we going to get the point across that the election is still valid, that the results are accurate even though some part of the election um, may have gone a little different than what we expected. So now um, we're going to get more into the concrete actions that we can take. Um, I'll give it to Alex to introduce this. Great, thanks Jack. Yeah, and so, um, so something that we think about at CISA a lot is how can the election infrastructure community coordinate within itself to share best practices and sort of mitigate threats that they see on the horizon. Um, so one of the one of the main things that as an election administrator that you can do um, is join an uh, information sharing and analysis center uh, or an ISAC. And so um, something that uh, we have done uh, in the past few years is stand up uh, an EI ISAC that is actually separate from CISA. However, it's a uh, it, it essentially coordinates between uh, like-minded officials in government that uh, administer election infrastructure uh, and sort of share threats and and do threat analysis. Um, it's critical to sort of do this sort of information sharing and, 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 you know, if you're an election administrator, joining this community is quite beneficial to you um, because, you know, no one is doing this alone. Everyone faces the same threats around the country. And so communicating about that is just is critical. And this also part of the MS ISAC, the multi-state uh, ISAC. And so um, the second point here is uh, CISA, uh, as the nation's risk manager, provides free services to those who uh, administer critical infrastructure and election infrastructure is part of that. Um, so we do things like remote penetration testing, uh, vulnerability assessments and other various services that often cost quite a lot on the private market. Uh, we, we will perform them for free for you. Um, so uh, we've seen a huge uptick in using these services in the past few years as the election threat has become uh, more publicized. Uh, so we've made a lot of progress here, but there's always more that we can do. And so, uh, you know, talking to us uh, and enlisting these services is, is a big step that uh, election officials can take. Great. And our third recommended action, acknowledging that there are many resource constraints, um, is just to accept outside help. Uh, for instance, the audience watching this today attending the DEF CON Voting Village is full of cybersecurity professionals who want to help ensure that elections can run smoothly and securely. Um, so we recommend states to take advantage of whatever volunteer resources there are. Um, and the first one to highlight here is the Election Cyber Surge, uh, which was recently announced by the University of Chicago in coordination with the DEF CON Voting Village. Uh, which is essentially establishing a volunteer core of cybersecurity professionals who want to help state and local election officials to better understand cybersecurity risks, to perform cybersecurity services all for free. Um, so this is a really fantastic resource to take advantage of. Um, and the second is to launch a vulnerability disclosure policy. 
and uh, vulnerability disclosure policy essentially says how um, outside hackers, um, friendly hackers, of course, can report vulnerabilities to you um, so that you can fix them and um, accept their support. Um, so the great thing is that there's already a community of people who want to help you. And all you have to do is tell them exactly how to do that. Um, so we'll um, talk about this a little more when we discuss the product that CISA recently launched, which is guidance to election officials to launch a vulnerability disclosure policy. But we believe that this is a really great way to accept the free volunteer help that is out there. Great. And then um, probably um, more relevant for most of this audience is how actual hackers can help um, protect elections ahead of November. Um, and one of the best ways you can do this is offer to help your local election officials just because they are quite constrained. Many um, operate with small budgets, even lower for IT or security. Um, so any free help can really go a long way. Um, so you can start perhaps by reaching out to your local election officials, see what areas might be able to help them. Um, volunteering for the election cyber surge is another great way to be paired with state and local election officials to answer questions, um, provide security services as needed. Um, so anything that you can go do on that front would go a really long way. The second point here is perhaps less of a security solution, but more um, just a way to help the overall election run smoothly, and that's serving as a poll worker um, if you are healthy and in a position to do so. Um, because as we mentioned, there are large poll worker shortages. So one of the most impactful things you can do is to serve on a local level as a poll worker, help ensure that elections are running smoothly um, and helping people vote. Um, so that's a really great way to be directly involved in the election process. Um, and our third point here is to participate in vulnerability disclosure policies, um, because we recently announced our guidance to state and local election officials. Um, so some vulnerability disclosure policies may be rolling out in the future. Um, so I would keep an eye out uh, for any of these that do pop up and help election officials when they put these out there and are asking for your help. Great. And so, uh, you know, as CISA employees, we'd be remiss to not mention uh, the various services and um, resources that CISA provides uh, in the space. So uh, as, as mentioned before, uh, CISA provides, um, you know, risk assessments uh, for free. Um, and so availing uh, of those is, is really useful. Um, additionally, uh, we have this Protect 2020 plan that uh, CISA has released, uh, outlining our strategy to sort of protect this election. Um, there's a lot of great resources on there, including how to stand up vote by mail systems um, safely in the coronavirus age, how to how to conduct in-person polling, uh, in, in -person polling uh, safely. And uh, this is in conjunction with the Election Assistance Commission. There's a lot of great resources on that page. And then in terms of some more specific areas um, that we think might be useful, um, the first is a vulnerability reporting guide, which I mentioned, um, that CISA just recently released. And this is a really great resource that discusses in depth, if you're an election official, how you can stand up a vulnerability dis disclosure policy and start receiving this volunteer help from um, security professionals. Um, so it's a really great way to engage the outside community in order to help secure your systems. Um, so we encourage anyone um, who's interested to follow this guidance um, and please do reach out to us if you have any additional questions on how to smoothly allow people to report vulnerabilities to you. Great, and with that, um, that's the conclusion of our talk. Um, we've listed here our Protect 2020 page again that has some really great resources on some of the core details on conducting elections. Um, our emails are listed here if you are interested, um, if you have any questions or just want to learn more. Um, I believe there will also be Q&A in Discord, um, so we'll be watching that. Um, but overall, thank you to everyone for attending this talk. Um, we're hopeful that together um, as both, um, say, election officials, as um, federal government, as the hacker community, we can all work collectively to help ensure that we have a safe and secure 2020 election. 
so thank you and please do reach out if you have any questions.